Good morning. In the interest of time, I am going to get started sharp on time here. Um, it's great to see a bunch of brave souls here, here at 8.15. As you realized on Friday, I ran out of time for a few slides. I think I've done that before in that lecture, which is no big deal, uh, because I'm, I have some spare time on Friday when we're going to talk about proteins. And the things we're going to bring up today and tomorrow are far more important, uh, or at least harder for you to learn on your own so that I'm deliberately going to spend the time necessary for that. What I also experimented with last year, and that I might do this year again if you feel you need it, that it's difficult to go through equations, or rather, it's difficult for you to follow when I go through equations. So I've uh, occasionally experimented a bit with doing a screen recording on my iPad while I draw the equations and talking about them. There are a couple of trial lectures for some of the things I'm going to go through, in particular tomorrow, I think. Let me know if you like them and I might do more. Today we're going to talk about the Boltzmann distribution, but before we get to that, I'm both going to go through some of the study questions from last week and I'm going to finish off with the uh, interactions. We didn't have time to go through them. So uh, as a Tuesday morning exercise, I would suggest we jump straight into some of these questions. So I spoke a lot about amino acids when I introduced the molecular structure last week. So can you come up with three ways or three properties by which you can classify amino acids? Size, polarity, shock. Size, polarity and? Shock. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and uh, pretty much your imagination is the only limitation. Um, aliphatic versus aromatic is an important one too, whether they have this ring hydrocarbons. There is one amino acid that is not chiral. Which one? Yes. Yes, yeah, so aliphatic versus aromatic. Aliphatic, um, this is fundamental organic chemistry, and I realized you're not chemists. So aliphatic carbon chains are just linear long carbon chains. They can certainly have double bonds too, but they're traditional, while what we call aromatic carbons are typically carbons that involve benzene rings. So aromatic amino acids might be um, phenylalanine and uh, tyrosine. They're amino acids where the side chains contain one of those rings. But it would be perfectly fine to just mention the three you did. I spoke about amino acids and chirality, so maybe we should start off with what is chirality? Asymmetric in one way, but there are lots of things, but they're asymmetric, but not chiral. A chair, for instance, is not symmetric. A chair has one symmetry axis, right? Here, but it's not symmetric if you cut it that way. Yes? Hmm? Exactly, so that's the key. Two molecules who are mirror images of each other, but it's not possible to rotate one to the other. And that requires one central bond with at least four partners bound, and they all have to be different. And that's true for the vast majority of amino acids, which give them a bit of peculiar physical properties. They will rotate light and a few other things. Uh, with one exception, there is one amino acid that is not chiral, which is Glycine, and why is it, uh, it chiral? Yeah. Exactly, so it doesn't have a side chain, right? It just has a hydrogen. There is one more highly special amino acid. Uh, which one? Yep. Hmm? And why is proline special? So it has this strange ring, right? The side chain is not just one chain, but it's a ring that goes back and binds to the nitrogen in the same amino acid. And what is normally bound to that nitrogen? <laughs> normally you have a hydrogen there, right? And that is the hydrogen that participates in, say, hydrogen bonds in an alpha helix. So the proline is going to be problematic here. It doesn't have that hydrogen. So it can not only does it not have the hydrogen, it has a bulky ring there. So proline simply it won't fit in most alpha helices. It can't form that hydrogen bond. 
What would happen if we had some de-isomer amino acids in a protein? What is a de-isomer? Hmm? So maybe I can start. So what is an isomer in chemistry? So an isomer is an example, again, of mirror molecules, right? The chirality is the center that causes the entire molecules to be isomers. Uh, so a D versus L amino acid has to do with this mirror images. And L is by far the most common in nature. Oh, sorry, now you can continue. Not just by far, it is the ones that we have in nature. So what would happen if you had a few D amino acids? Mm -hmm. So we can first, we, let, let us be simpler first. We talked about alpha helices, for instance, right? But the alpha helix is always a given direction. And if you now have one amino acid that's a mirror of this, it would not be compatible with anything. You could not have an alpha helix and then suddenly have a D amino acid in it because the D amino acids would prefer the alpha helix to have the opposite hand of this, right? So it would break everything, uh, completely incompatible with biology, well, or with the molecular properties. Whether that is good or bad depends. It's, the first approximation is bad. Your bodies would never produce the amino acids, but occasionally, just now and then, as you mentioned, you might actually want to use this to introduce something that is bioincompatible. And the obvious case is we would like to take a drug that you can take orally as a pill, but it should not be digested by all the enzymes in your stomach. And the reason why that happens is that the enzymes have really been trained through evolution to recognize the L amino acids, not the D ones. And what those amino, sorry, what those enzymes in your stomach do, they are specifically optimized to break something, which is a matter of question five, how amino acids are linked into a protein. Hmm? Why is a peptide bond special? Sorry? Right, it's a fairly strong and rigid bond. You also, you can't rotate around it and it's, it's, never, it's not a bond that would ever split spontaneously. It's a very strong covalent bond. So what these enzymes do, they're a gigantic catalyst that causes the amino acid to bind in the right place, and this bond cleaves, and then you have separate amino acids. But once you have formed this chain, uh, because in the body we do the opposite, right? And particularly in the ribosome, then we stitch amino acids together based on the gene sequence you have uh, in DNA. Uh, in particular, these triplets, the DNA codons. At some point, we start out with this very long chain that I showed you. And in principle, that's all we have. All we have is uh, our atoms that are bonded into a very complex, large molecule that then packs up in space. And we're going to go through, start going through how that happens on Friday. But to make your life easier, we try to organize this in some sort of symbolic levels to avoid having to focus on every single individual atom all the time. What are these levels and what do they represent? So why do we why did we end up with these four levels? So that's a complete of course a completely arbitrary definition in many ways and I would argue occasionally that's as a physicist that's actually what can be hard with biology. Everything is not governed by strict laws, right? Some things are just based on observation and this makes sense. So the and on each level, what you try to identify is commonality. So the sequence, of course, you only have 20 amino acids. They are all stitched together. All proteins, with very few exceptions, are linked together in a linear chain with a start and an end. It's very rare to have any circles. And that means that's an obvious first way to start describing things. What is the order in this chain? And then, as we realized, actually even before the first protein structures appeared, that there are two very common ways to assemble these, either in the spiral forms, the helices, or up and down, well, they can be parallel to uh, long extended sheets. They can be turns to, but two or three different ways, and that's reasonable to classify that as a level, and that's the secondary structure then. 
And then in principle, the only normal structure we're going to talk about is then the third level. How do these elements then pack up into a large structure? And in principle, that's all you need to know. But to complicate things further, there are a few cases. In particular, the ribosome itself is a gigantic protein. And then you don't, this small ball that has curled up, that really is the molecule. But the ribosome is then a collection of roughly 58 such balls. So it's a gigantic super molecule. And to start describing this, it's going to turn out that these have to fold independently. That's why we occasionally introduce this tertiary structure. But we're not going to talk a whole lot about that in the class. We spoke both on Friday and on uh, Wednesday, I think it was, about the relation between sequence structure and function. Can you say something about that? And that's very much related to 8 too. What leads to what? And this is something I should be able to wake you up at 2 a.m. in the morning, and you should instantly say sequence leads to structure, leads to function. Uh, there are not a whole lot of things you need to learn by heart. Actually, that's a great thing with biophysics. Uh, in one way, it's more close to life than physics, but it just in contrast to life science, we try to avoid learning things too much thing by heart. But knowing some of these mantra will enable you to understand and think better about problems, right? If somebody asks them, why does something have a particular function? Well, that must be explained by the structure. And that structure must be explained by the constituent amino acids in the protein. But related to that, can function ever induce structure? So can the structure of the protein ever somehow be dependent on the function? So there are a couple of very cool examples I'm going to come back to later in the class. Uh, or actually, no, maybe it will be Lucy who gets a chance to tell you about that. Globular proteins. Hemoglobin, uh, the small molecule that binds oxygen in your blood. It turns out that it depends on the species and who you are. So a llama has hemoglobin that has a slightly different structure that is much better at binding oxygen than you. Why? But why does the llama need a better ability to bind oxygen? In general, they live at an altitude of a few thousand meters, right? So the contents of the oxygen is lower. Uh, a fetus, baby, uh, has a different type of fetal hemoglobin that is better at binding oxygen than a normal one. Why? Yeah. <laughs> because otherwise, right, that if the mother and the fetus, if the fetus would not be able to steal the oxygen from the mother, you would not have oxygen being transported from the air to the mother's blood and then over the placenta exchange to the fetus. But of course, the second you're born, this is then a gene that's silenced and then you no longer need it. So in principle, the answer is no. The function itself doesn't induce this, but through evolution, there are then patterns that will lead to this diversity of uh, structures. But there are tiny differences. You wouldn't even be able to spot it unless you knew what you were looking for. And then we started to talk about interactions that I'm going to continue in a minute here. Uh, what would you argue are the most important degrees of freedom? There are two things. Are we going to talk about degrees of freedom and we're going to talk more about interactions in a few minutes here. So what are the degrees of freedom that are most relevant in the protein? Because there are a ton of degrees of freedom in a protein, right? You can have, hundred, you can have a million atoms multiplied by three. That's three million degrees of freedom. Mm, but not interactions, right? So what in the back, what degrees of freedom in the backbone are the ones that you could describe most of the things with? Um, right, so there are these rotations around the two bonds that are not the peptide bond, the flexible bonds. And we just call them phi and psi in lack of imagination. And the reason why they are important is that if you rotate a side chain, that will only have a local effect. If you start rotating along this chain, if you rotate in the middle of the protein, the entire second half of the protein will rotate. So that will have a global change in the conformation. Related to that, I kind of lied to you and said that that peptide bond is, well, only kind of. I, I told you that the peptide, well, you told me that the peptide bond is rigid. 
Normally, the peptide bonds is always in a trans configuration, so that if you look at the entire backbone, it would go like the aliphatic chains I drew here, straight all the time. But, uh, and, by, and that's why in, what in chemistry we would call that a trans peptide bond. Technically, it is possible for the peptide bond to be in cis, uh, but since it can't rotate, if you put it in cis, it's gonna stay in cis. And that's virtually never observed, why? Hmm? The side chains in particular would be close to each other, so that unless, if you have two glycines, it could work. Uh, but in general, any second you actually have a side chain, those side chains would then end up being on the same side of the chain and bump into each other. The one exception to this is proline, uh, because with proline, the entire configuration is differ different due to this ring. So with proline, in an ideal world, proline would always be cis, while all the other ones were always trans. Unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. So all the other ones, I would normally eat my left shoe if they were not trans. No, not quite. That's, but proline is kind of 50-50. All bets are off with proline. It's horrible. But you will never be able, you can't predict it. You would need a the help of a computer or something to do it. So, Related to these degrees of freedoms, there were two very important discoveries or a hypothesis by first Christian Amfinsen and then Cyrus Leventhal that I mentioned towards the end of Friday. What did they say? Understanding this will help you understand a ton of topics that we will keep repeating in the course. Almost. Yes, and that's, I, I haven't brought this up with you yet, but the, my reason for being strict, the global minimum of free energy. Do you realize, no you don't, I, even I don't realize, anyway, this is the guy who connected life science to physics. That life science is fundamentally, even something as complicated as proteins, all these molecules in our body, the way they exist, it's not just some magic factories building the molecule in the specific way you want. We just need the blueprint of the molecule and then physics will sort it out. Awesome result. Uh, and it was, so, it was so extreme when it was first tried that he had, of course, had to prove this experimentally and everything. And the reason you get a Nobel Prize is not just to have the idea, but prove that it's actually true, at least in general. And Cyrus Leventhal. Yes. So. An important distinction here, it's not that Cyrus didn't believe this, uh, but Cyrus pointed out that, huh, that's funny, that leads to an interesting problem, that we all agree that they will fold, but there are so many degrees of freedom in this, so that if you were to search all these degrees of freedom, and it would only take like a millisecond or something per degree of freedom, it would take you longer than the age of the universe for a protein to fold. So there is something fundamental here we don't understand, and we still don't understand it. We're gonna come back to this later on in the class and explain it. We spoke a little bit about Ramachandran plots too. What was that? Hmm? Yes, and in particular, you could even put dots, right? If you look at a large protein, we could classify all the, this particular protein, what are the residues, what are the phi and psi angles? And the reason for that is, again, to try to take a step back. That's gonna be a recurring pattern. We don't wanna look at the atoms, because if we look at the atoms, it's just too much information. And rather than worrying about whether the phi and psi angle is 59 or 42, I'm gonna let you in a secret. You can define what are the phi and psi angles that corresponds to helix and the sheet. I don't know that. It's completely useless knowledge. Uh, why on earth would I try to know that by heart? But I know the rough areas in the Ramachandran diagram that corresponds to helix and sheet. And that means I could always, if I was ever asked this on an exam, I could draw this in 30 seconds, and then I would realize, yeah, that must be helix and that must be sheet. So most of these complicated concepts are actually there to help you. So rather than having to worry about the angles, you worry about rough areas and everything, pretty much everything that's not helix and sheet, we can forget about. <laughs> 
So we, I, spoke, I ended up by speaking very briefly about the formation differences, the properties of helices and sheets. We will come back to that on Friday when we talk about the structure. But there were some key differences there, in particular about locality of interactions. Mm -hmm. And that has to do that the hydrogen bonds we form in helices, they're always hydrogen bonds closed in sequence. All hydrogen bonds have to be closed in space, right? Otherwise they won't form. But in a helix, you're forming a hydrogen bond with a neighbor residue four units away. I to I plus four. That's also one of those things that you need to know in your sleep. I to I plus four. So that the residue 14 will form a hydrogen bond with residue 18. Etc. I didn't have time to bring up the chemical bonds and interactions, so I'm going to get started with that. Um, so we have a time to get on to Bolt, the Boltzmann distribution today. And for all these things, don't hesitate. If there are anything that you don't understand, I might not spend long uh, periods during the lectures to talk about it. But if there is anything, I can always make a small extra recording or something so that you can watch it at your own pace. I showed some of these movies. And I'm not going to spend time to go through all of them, but the cool part here is that in the 1960s when people started determining X-ray structures, everything was rigid. We only had exact positions of the atoms. And then what a few groups realized that you can actually use computers both to visualize these and possibly even try to improve the structures. Can we fix things so that we minimize the structures and put the bond and the torsions and the angle in exactly the right position? Because the experiment is noisy. And in conjunction to this, they made some of the very first molecular visualizations. So these are images I got from a colleague at uh, the LMB. And you would probably, they didn't exactly do this at their laptops. Um, so these were the types of computers they used for it. So that typewriter in the rear is how you actually enter the operations in the computer. And the only screen you have, you don't have a screen that can show text, really. Uh, the only screen you had were these ones where you could visualize it in 3D. And you would program them with punch cards. Uh, so you would spend a week pro designing your program. And then you would hand over the entire stack of punch cards to the secretary. And then you would get it back 30 seconds later saying that's a typo on line 47. Um, and then you would have to go back home. And you would have to wait another week to get time at 2 AM in the morning on the computer. So that we have no idea how insanely spoiled you are. This is actually a Mac. It's a multi-access computer, um, not quite the one designed by Apple, though. And Cyrus that we usually see pictures of in a suit and tie that I think he spent most of his time in front of these screens. Uh, and that's Cyrus in action. So, so he was one of the first physicists slash computer people. And for, partly for historical reasons, this is very much a field, in particular the X-ray crystallography that has been dominated by physicists uh, because it's hard math. But before we go back to physics, I'm going to take you to a slight detour in chemistry. Um, so this is not a class on quantum chemistry, and in a second we're going to forget most about quantum mechanics. The reason we talk about degrees of freedom a few minutes ago, but in addition to the degree, the degrees of freedom describes how the molecules can move. But in addition to that, we also need to think about how will they interact, because the interaction it was causes the motions. Why do they want to be close or far away? And at the end of the day, this is all determined by the electronic interactions. Uh, some of you have studied quantum mechanics, others haven't. Uh, for instance, we have the Pauli exclusion principle saying that two electrons cannot occupy the same quantum state. And that means that there is, if you push them too close, there is, they're going to repel each other. Uh, and this whole pattern will also cause that, depending on the specific spin of atoms, occasionally you can form bonds, um, in particular by pairing up electrons. There is a huge amount of theory in there that would easily fill an entire class. But chemists like to frequently explain this in slightly easier ways. You can use, for instance, so-called orbitals. And that's a way of thinking that you've probably heard about this SP orbitals in upper secondary school, right? So chemists have very simple ways of trying to describe when will bonds form and when will they not form. And sure, at, at the basic level, there are going to be a ton of electrons involved in bonds on the amino acids. But I'm going to forget about that from now. And the reason for that is that those bonds are so strong that they virtually never break. 
even the peptide bond, the only case where the peptide bond breaks or is formed is by enzymes in your stomach or in the ribosome where we build the protein. The second the protein is built, that bond is there. It's stuck. So with that, we can forget about the bond formation. Um, it's not quite that easy, though, because that we still have to carry a little. Yes? I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, for now, we're just talking about interactions. We, don't worry. We're going to talk about more entropy than you like in this class. <laughs> uh, actually, I love entropy. Uh, so that larger R, it becomes slightly complicated because you still have these atoms, right? And as I mentioned, that occasionally we complicate life by trying to organize it so that you have two nuclei of atoms, and they can either be close or far away. And in nature, this is, of course, a continuum. There's nothing magic that happens at exactly 1.52 angstrom. But as you're moving far away, we tend to focus on other things, right? And that's occasionally we classify things in different ways. So you've all studied hydrogen bonds and these properties. If you have two molecules, the properties of one molecule might influence another molecule. And in many cases, we don't care about this. But say if you have a water molecule, uh, there you have the... Uh, electrons to the, towards the oxygen, right? And then you have a deficit of electrons in the hydrogens. And that means that you're going to have a small dipole with a plus towards the hydrogens and a minus sign towards the oxygens. Xenon doesn't have a dipole, but xenon has both electrons around in the shell around the nucleus and then a nucleus. But when, this, when the electrons in the xenon sees this water, the electrons might actually decide to move slightly towards my side because that way the electrons will be slightly further away from the oxygen. But that will mean that the whole xenon atom will have a small positive partial charge towards the water. That's going to like the oxygen because the oxygen is already negative. So by having the electrons just being just so slightly offset, we're, the water here is effectively inducing. It's creating a temporary dipole in the xenon. You don't have to limit this to water. Um, so if this, forget about the water now. This is just a fluctuation. That you have one, the Mike Xenon atom here. Forget about the water. It just happened to have the electrons slightly displaced towards my side. If that Xenon atom then sees another Xenon atom, the other Xenon atom will re react to the first Xenon atom. Say, oh, you have displaced your electrons. Then it makes sense for me to display mine too. So that a small temporary fluctuating dipole in one atom can actually induce a dipole in another atom. And this happens all the time. Now, a nanosecond later, this will have been, actually, not an attosecond later, this have, uh, will have been reverted. But it means that as the charges fluctuate due to thermal motion, it will be natural these, these atoms will actually start to attract each other a little bit. Even though they don't have any formal charge, they don't even have a formal dipole. And this is the reason why virtually every single substance, including helium, neon, or argon, will, they won't necessarily stay a gas, but eventually they will form a liquid and even a solid. And that's due to this very weak dipole-dipole interaction. Yes? No, no, this, flu this fluctuates all the time. It's uh, on an attosecond level, right? But the whole point, they never repel each other, unless they get so close so that the electrons start bumping into each other. So at very long distance, they're never going to repel each other. But any type of fluctuation will, on average, create some attraction between them. It's going to be a tiny attraction. But since all the atoms will attract each other, the collective part will always be attraction. How strong this is depends on how much motion there is. Um, if the thermal motion is high, you're going to override it. But at very low temperature, when the molecules don't move as fast and everything, this is going to be a more pronounced effect. So helium, for instance, doesn't become a liquid until roughly 4 degrees Kelvin. The cool thing is that you can actually prove this. Uh, you don't need quantum chemistry for this. You can prove that this will lead to an interaction that has one uh, of the power one to the, 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 uh, the sixth inverse power of the distance between them. And this uh, London uh, showed this originally. And the way you describe this, you've heard, heard about this is called Lennard Jones interactions. They will occur for all the atoms. They're weaker than anything else, but since they're always attractive at large distance, and if you get to very short distance, they will eventually repel each other since they can't overlap. Yep. Why does that make the gases become liquid? So 
Oh, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. Um, when it comes to energy, uh, at some point, all energy is relative, right? Um, the zero, there is no obvious zero level for energy in the world. So the way we typically describe this is that when atoms are infinitely far apart, they don't interact at all. And that's a reasonable level to say that's zero energy. The entire field of physics called condensed matter physics, that is the realm when we start with when atoms start to interact. And when atoms start to interact, well, under some circumstances, they will repel each other, but that's not particularly interesting because if they repel each other, they will just go away and stop interacting. The interesting part is that when atoms start interacting in favorable ways, when they start attracting each other, because when they start, if they, we have, for instance, we have a ton of water vapor in the air here, but those water molecules are so far away that they don't interact. But in those water bottles you have, uh, for whatever conditions, the water atoms like to stick together, and that gives the water completely different properties. And that happens towards lower temperatures, uh, towards higher pressures and everything, simply when, when the surrounding factors makes it more advantageous for the atoms to start interacting. So any type of favorable interactions with the, when the molecules start to attract, even the water molecules in the air attract here, but that attraction is so weak that they haven't condensed. And then as these gradually become stronger, eventually you will get to a point where it will condense. And if you condense far enough, you actually form a liquid. The, con the transition between liquid to solid is slightly different. I'll show you that in a second prize. And of course, if you wanted to treat this exactly, you have to do quantum chemistry. This is insanely difficult. Uh, because quantum chemistry, you would forget about xenon, right? Even for a simple molecule, if you're gonna be strict here, to describe these interactions exactly, there is no alternative to doing quantum chemistry. The good thing with quantum chemistry is we can solve that with paper and pen, as long as you don't have more than one electron. But then this would be a fairly boring class because there are not a whole lot of biological molecules that only have one electron. Not any, if I <laughs> think about it. Uh, the other way of thinking about this is that it would, even if you could, you could only handle roughly 100 atoms. This is insane. When I took the classes like this, people were proud that we could handle six atoms. So 100 atoms is nice, but it's certainly no biology. Maybe one amino acid, and then you would not have water around the amino acid. Uh, did I say quantum chemistry? Well, the problem is that all the quantum mechanics that you teach in a, get taught in a physics class here, that's also correct. Because to be strictly correct, you should have relativistic time dependent quantum mechanics. And now it gets really, really, really complicated. So physics is built on simplifications and we need to simplify things here. And the reason, the reason simplifications work, the proof there is in the eating of the pudding. You have to show that your simplifications are reasonable. You can't just simplify because you don't have any alternative. Uh, but if you think the way the chemists do this, what you would simplify, you would, for instance, say that all the heavy nuclei, they don't move. You just look at the electrons. That's a horrible approximation. So now you're at the point that you're not going to have water. You're not going to have, sorry, you're not going to have any motion whatsoever. That means that you're doing everything at zero Kelvin. And this class was supposed to be about life science. There's absolutely nothing that happens at zero Kelvin. So you can be very happy that you've got a perfect wave equation for one state but you can forget everything about life. So the problem is that quantum chemistry, the way you normally handle it, has other limitations. And those 100 atoms, you will see your fair share of people who claim that they can do a quantum mechanical calculation of a protein. And then there are some things that they ignore, such as water. So you're now gonna study your proteins in vacuum. So you're gonna do life science in vacuum at zero Kelvin. Good luck with that. I know what the result is going to be. There's not a single protein that will have any function whatsoever in vacuum at zero Kelvin. So the point is not necessarily, in theory, time-dependent relativistic quantum mechanics is better, but you're going to throw out the baby with the water due to the other approximations you have to do there. And in principle, we know that biology works. Biology has some really cool examples that if I poke myself here, I don't die. Biology has stability properties, right? It's not really that sensitive to details. Uh, you can do fairly horrible things with the body and will still survive. Uh, 
But even if you started from quantum chemistry, you would have other issues. You would be extrapolating 15 orders of magnitude. And there were a bunch of people who fairly early in the 70s, 60s, 70s, realized that maybe we can do this in another way. And those, uh, Ari Warshall in particular, came up with that. Let's cheat completely. So let's just assume that treat all your atoms like small bolts. Uh, forget entirely about quantum mechanics. And then parameterize things. So let's say, so how much do these balls attract each other? Um, you can use Lennard Jones interactions, roughly like you learned in undergraduate chemistry. Have some way of saying that one over R6, they should attract each other. At very short distances, they have to repel. There are some charges on the atoms. Let's pretend that the charge on the atoms doesn't vary. That would assume that the electrons stay close to each nucleus, but that might be good enough. And then you're going to end up with a ton of parameters, hundreds of parameters, just what are all the partial charges in your atoms. But the cool thing is that in real life, you're occasionally allowed to cheat because we can parameterize, we can fit most of those parameters to simple properties such as liquids. So for water, we know what the heat of vaporization and the density of water should be. And then we tune the parameters to reproduce this. This worked so well that they were able to not just minimize proteins, they were able to simulate the first uh, enzyme functionality and everything using quantum mechanics for a very small part, but literally start to show how atoms are moving. And uh, Martin Karplus were among the first people to show that how proteins actually, proteins move even at 100 Kelvin in an X-ray crystal because 100 Kelvin is not zero Kelvin. And they could use this to show why you have this broadening and kind of noise in crystals and this really corresponds to motion in the X-ray crystals. Again, it's a remarkably cool result because they showed this theoretically before we had the experimental results. And for this, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2013. So if we go into the details there, uh, this is just a tiny part of a molecule, but you can see that it rapidly gets very complicated. Rather than doing the quantum chemistry way here, let's pretend that we are a Warshall and how we need a very highly simplified way of describing this. So you're going to have some sort of bond there. But rather than having the quantum chemical exact correct description of that bond, um, well, you can do this in lots of different ways. You can introduce the quantum chemistry. Uh, and if you're now going to have a quantum mechanical oscillator, there are certain energy levels that this can adapt. And you might remember that from quantum mechanics if you're taking the class. But what Ari very quickly realized, at room temperature, you're going to have 99% of the bond in the ground state. And maybe 1% of the bond will be 1% longer. Yeah, that's very important for a protein, not. So let's just, let's just approximate this with either a rigid stick or a small spring that is this length. And then forget about, yes, of course, if you simulate this as 5,000 Kelvin, this is going to be bad, but it's fairly rare to have 5,000 Kelvin processes in the cell, so we're going to be down here. So it's a super simple approximation. Let's just introduce that small spring. And rather than having quantum chemistry, you get a harmonic function there. In theory, we can choose to have this exponential to accept that eventually you can stretch a bond, but that's virtually never used because bonds typically don't break in proteins. This works remarkably well. It's so remarkable that it's scary. We can do exactly the same thing with angles. Uh, if you have two bonds defined here, yeah, I can define the angle between these three atoms. And this is now a super complicated quantum chemical description with resonances between multiple electrons and everything. Or we just forget about that and do pretty much exactly the same things there. This angle will only move a couple of degrees. It might be 109.5 degrees by default, or 120 in this case, and it might be 118 or 122. So yeah, so maybe not completely unimportant, but it's going to vary so little so that any type of approximation here is going to be fine. And you probably know this as your physicists, but uh, why do we use harmonic functions for all these things? Why use x squared? Why not something else? Uh, so this is a problem where you've had far too much physics. We bombard you with physics so much that you forget about the simple things of physics. You might even think that Hooke's law, this has to do with Hooke's law when you extend a spring, right? Do you think that Hooke's law is correct? Oh my God. Um, the reason for this is that virtually everything in physics is super complicated. 
find a mathematical form to describe that. Or to make it to be slightly nicer to you, let's say that we have some energy here that describes some sort of extension. It's not entirely trivial to describe that function. But if I start as we're going to come back to, at equilibrium, when this system is happy, it's eventually going to be at the lowest point here. It will find its minimum. So by default, you're going to be here, right? So what do we know here? Well, we can't describe the entire function, but we know that we have some sort of function value here. The value at x0. Then we have a derivative. What is the derivative at the minimum? Zero, so we can forget about the derivative. What do we have after the first derivative? <laughs> second derivative. So then you have some sort of second derivative at that value. And we can now describe how this function varies in a small region around that by multiplying that with the delta x squared divided by two. And that's why all these things are harmonics. Because we have no idea what that second derivative is exactly, but it is a number. That is a number, and that's the k in the equation. That's the, uh, the spring constant or the harmonic constant. So virtually everything we do is that around a minimum, we can describe everything as an harmonic. And that's why all the bonds and functions, they're harmonics. That's what physicists do if we don't know better. The third part, though, here I'm going to break a little bit with what I just said. We spoke about this torsion angles or the dihedral angles, the rotation about around phi and psi. In principle, we can describe this with the same motion. But so with, now I'm going to need, you might see the pattern. First, I had two atoms for a bond, three atoms for an angle, and now I'm going to have four atoms involved for a torsion. And now I want to describe what happens when I rotate around this torsion. This gets just a tiny bit trickier for two reasons. First, if you rotate an entire turn, 360 degrees or 2 pi, for obvious reasons, I want to be back at the same value, right? And if you have a simple molecule, say at etane or something, you're not just going to have one minimum per turn, but you might actually have three minimum per turn, right? So that I can't use a normal harmonic function for these. So in most of these cases, we end up saying, oh, sorry. Um, in most of these cases, I can describe these torsions, and now I need to find a mathematical way that is both periodic and that has some sort of repeating pattern. And the obvious ways to do that is to use trigonometric functions, sine or cosines. For a very simple one, you might end up with a cosine. So this is, let's see, this is butane rotating around that bond. And if you have butane rotating around that bond, you're going to end up with a function that looks roughly like this. Now, of course, it's not going to look exactly like this, because this will depend on electrons and their exact distribution and everything. But this turns out to be a really good approximation. And really good in this area, it's like it's going to, the error might be 0.1 kcal or so far lower than the thresholds I'm going to come back to later today and tomorrow. So we're fairly happy with these. The energies here are not high. The energies here involved here are much lower than the bonds and angles, but that's going to turn, that's actually good. Because these are energy barriers that we can occasionally go over, and that's why, again, why they are by far the most important degrees of freedom. The peptide bond, in contrast, has a gigantic energy barrier. It's so strong that it will never rotate spontaneously, but that also makes it very boring. If it's an energy barrier that's so high you never get over it, it's irrelevant. And you can make this just as complicated as you want. We could, in principle, take our small, if you have a small amino acid here, this is the simplest one you can imagine. Essentially, we have a Ramachandran diagram. It's a phi and psi, but instead of now plotting hash marks whether things are uh, allowed or not. For each of these, for each value of the combination of phi and psi here, I can actually plot what the energy here is. And then you start end up with the energy landscape that describes that you have a few places where this molecule is happy to be, and then lots of high energy regions here in red where it's not strictly impossible, but it's very unlikely to be here. And this is as complicated as it gets just for a single amino acid. We're gonna keep making that even worse in a second. I will have two more slides, and then I'm going to leave you for the break. What all these interactions I brought up this far have in common is that they're bonded, so they're things that stick together. There are also the 
what we call non-bonded large-scale interactions, and that could be charges, positive and negative, and it can also be these packing effects, Van der Waals or Lennard Jones interactions, that things can bump into each other and everything attracts at long range. They're frequently weaker, but there's a ton of them that can easily overcome other effects. Lennard Jones interactions is the obvious example, right? There are millions of them, but since they're all attractive, that's why the water will eventually condense. For the charges, we end up describing this. We can use any charges, but instead of having all the electrons and everything here, we cheat. And I just say that there is a small partial charge on the atom. So for a benzene, I would have maybe minus 0.06 on the carbon and plus 0.06 on the hydrogens. That's a rough approximation of the wave functions and roughly where the electrons are. But around room temperature, it's going to work great. Uh, you will be able to describe the density of benzene and how the benzene behaves and everything. So after the break, uh, I have a few more slides on this. We're going to talk a little about the strength of electrostatics, and then we're going to head into the hydrogen bonds. Um, so electrostatics is special because it's a very strong interaction. It's four orders of magnitude stronger than Lennard jones interactions. And that leads to some unexpected but quite fun effects in particular for water. So let's meet here at a quarter past and then I'll continue. We spoke about electrostatics, right? Um, the most special thing about electrostatic is how insanely strong it is. And not, it's not just strong. If you know your undergraduate physics well, you will remember that it's electrostatic energy goes as one over the one over R. So it's also very long range. And just to give a, have a hunch about the um, the energies that might involve. If you, if you would to have two charges separated by only one angstrom, which is admittedly a super short distance, you're talking about hundreds of kcals per mole. It's an insanely large energy. While the bond rotations we spoke about a few slides ago around those torsions, right, there were a few kcals. So that's order of magnitude stronger. The other non-bonded interaction were these van der Waals interactions. That if I talk about non-bonded interactions in general, we typically call them van der Waals. Uh, but the nomenclature is a bit fuzzy here. Uh, it's chemists, not physicists. And there are two parts here. At very short distances, there is repulsion due to the atomic overlap. And at very long distances, there's this 1 over r to the power of 6 interaction that all atoms will attract each other. And the best way to, you can actually describe that exactly. The repulsion by quantum chemistry has to be exponential, and the attraction there has to be 1 over R6. Unfortunately, on most computers, the exponential is very difficult to calculate. Uh, expensive, not difficult, but it takes a few hundred clock cycles. And you were spoiled today, but uh, Ari Warshall certainly wasn't spoiled in the 1960s. This, was, this rapidly became a bottleneck. But what you then realize, unless you're trying to design nuclear weapons, you don't, you're, not, you're never going to be in here. It doesn't really matter. It overlaps. All overlap is bad. Whether it's bad or astronomically bad is really the same. So what people fairly quickly came up with, that if you have 1 over R6, you can just square that one clock cycle and get 1 over R12, which is something that's larger. And that's good enough. Actually, it's not good enough at all. It's a fairly horrible approximation. But you see, the problem is worse than that. Even the equation I showed on the previous slide is incorrect. Because in quantum chemistry, you also need to include triplets of atoms, quartets of atoms, five-body interactions, six-body interactions, all the way up to an infinite number of interactions. And that rapidly causes you to just scratch your head, and it's just ugly. But here's where we can cheat instead. If we have an approximate interaction, such as this 1 over R12 and 1 over R6, which is the Lennard jones interaction form, well, both those Cs are constants, so we can parameterize them. So the cool thing is that we tune them to fit experiments. We don't derive them bottom up from the fundamental laws of physics, but we adjust them to fit experiments, and that works remarkably well. So by having these parameters, we can also stick to pairwise interactions. We never look at three atoms at the time, and yet we get a functional form that describes reality really well. So occasionally cheating is good. And these two things together create some very peculiar properties for molecules. Uh, we already spoke a little bit about hydrogen bonds. That the quantum chemical nature of the oxygen will mean that there are effectively four directions where the, the free electrons will uh, protrude. 
So along two of these directions, those correspond to the bonds we have the hydrogens. Um, and then in addition to that, you have free or lone electron pairs. Uh, so there are, in addition, the water is kind of, the, each water mole is kind of like a small tetrahedron with two small ears pointing out that we typically don't draw. That corresponds to the electrons you see up here. There you have it. And if you now have two such waters close to each other, that, that hydrogen, which just has a slight positive partial charge, is going to love to interact with this free electron pair here and the other oxygen here. And that's really what creates these hydrogen bonds. It's not limited to water, but this happens any time you have a large or electronegative atom, such as oxygen or nitrogen, that is bound to a hydrogen. So then the hydrogen will donate some of its electrons to the oxygen, uh, and that oxygen bound to the hydrogen is called donor, and then the other oxygen on the other molecule is called an acceptor. And then you create a relatively strong bond. It's much stronger than normal ionic interactions, so it's borderline a covalent real chemical bond. And this might be a few kcals or so in water. So it's the same ballpark as those uh, torsions. The hydrogen bond, as we already talked about, is responsible for a ton of things. In addition to water, it's really what creates both the structure of DNA, RNA, uh, the base pairing, but also the, uh, the structure of the beta sheets and the alpha helices. So that's a super, you could even argue it's the most important non-bonded interaction in proteins. And in theory, this could also explain some things like protein folding. So if this long chain, if we just have this chain stretched out in water first on the left here, what you would then have is that if you have polar or charged residues here, or rather any side chain that can, where the side chain can participate in a hydrogen bond, those cha side chains would normally, if they're, if they're hydrophilic, they would happily participate in hydrogen bonds, but if they're hydrophobic, you would need to have water packed around them. That's not particularly good because those water molecules would not be able to participate in as many hydrogen bonds. So just hand waving a bit, you can almost say it might make sense here to take all those hydrophobic side chains that can't participate in hydrogen bonds and turn them to some sort of inside of the protein while you have all the ones that like to form hydrogen bonds as part of the surface. And this is actually one of the first things that happens when you put a protein chain in water that the hydrophobic groups will turn to the inside, just like a droplet of oil in water. I'm going to come back to that um, later today. But what we've roughly created this far is that if you like equations for any type of small molecule, we can formulate fairly simple physical procedures. They're super simplified, although there are a lot of some Greek letters here. But you have bonds, angles, these torsions. There are some improperties here, which is basically a way to keep, keep some things planar. But we, can, we don't have to care about that for now. And then you have charges, electrostatics, and you have all these non-bonded interactions. And this is actually enough to describe proteins. It's a horrible oversimplification compared to quantum chemistry. The cool thing here is that I can calculate all the interactions of a protein in a tenth of a millisecond. And as you're going to see later, this means that we can run very large advanced computer simulations where we actually simulate entire proteins, which would be completely impossible if we tried to do it with quantum chemistry. But we will come back to the motions later on. If you have a large molecule like that, each way you put the molecule, this is fairly boring, it's just a single water molecule moving, but if you have a protein that you move in different ways, for every conformation, every possible orientation of all the atoms, you could calculate this V, what the potential energy is. And then you have a potential energy that in principle is a function of six million degrees of freedom if you have a ribosome. And I'm not sure about you, but I find it really difficult to think of six million dimensional space. So we're going to simplify that slightly and stick to two dimensions. So if you have two dimensions, we could have an x and a y axis. And then as a function of these two, which could be Ramachandran, sorry, it could be the phi and psi torsions, right? For each value there, there would then be a value of the potential energy that would be these surfaces. And what we want to now want to understand is that why will the a molecule, such as a protein, adopt certain conformations in this landscape, and why will it move between them? But we don't really have the theoretical tools to do that yet. So what we're going to need is a way to say that for an energy landscape in general here, what parts are bad and what are good? You can probably already now guess that high energy in general is bad, while low energy is good. But it's not going to be as simple as saying that you will have all the protein here and you will never be here. This other blue part here is also kind of good. It's just not quite as good as the best part. Yes? Uh, 
For now, I'm deliberately going to leave that open. Uh, for now, let's pretend that we, I know that I mentioned free energy earlier today, but for now, let's pretend that we don't know what free energy is. We only know about energy. So what I defined on the previous slide was a function that calculated potential energy in physics. So for a second, let's assume that's the only thing we know about, strict energy for now. Those of you who are physicists will likely have seen an equation to handle this, the Boltzmann distribution, right? How many of you are familiar with that? Oh, that's me. In that case, I might take some of these things slightly faster to save a bit of time. But the Boltzmann distribution will determine a lot of things. So for instance, if you have oxygen as a function of temperature, what's the speed distribution is going to be? So the Boltzmann distribution will really start to get to the heart of this, what things will happen, um, or at least at equilibrium. The book goes through this in two stages. I'm, I'm just going to do this hand-waving version today. I might do a small screen recording of this too uh, to help you. And then tomorrow I'm going to do this properly. Uh, the cool thing with doing this, the bad thing with doing it for a special case is that I've only proven it for a special case. But it might help you a bit to show that we actually can derive this. So what the book here, Finkelstein does, uh, is that if you assume something very simple, that you have a gas in a column, very narrow column, you're going to have some sort of equilibrium distribution of molecules in this, that you're going to have more molecules at the bottom here, where the potential energy is low. But if it was only a matter of potential energy, all the gas molecules would be at the bottom. That can't happen, because then the density, the pressure here would be too high. So some molecules want to be further up. But so we need to find a way to balance at each level in a small yellow slice here. The number of molecules there is going to be a balance between the gravity and the potential energy pushing it down, while the pressure pushing it up, because the pressure is higher down there. And there are a bunch of definitions one could do here, but since we're doing a special case, we're not going to worry too much about the detail. Uh, if you're a chemist, you know that PV equals nRT, and if you're a physicist, you like to say PV equals nKT. The only difference between those is that chemists love to calculate in moles, while physicists, we prefer to count in a number of molecules. Either is fine, you just have to be consistent. And if you were to do this for a specific case, there were a ton of things we would need to introduce the specific volume of the vessel and everything. To, to avoid that, you can just say that instead of large n, we use small n. So we calculate what are the number of molecules per volume instead of the number of molecules in total. And that means that we can also say, sorry, oops, my bad. Uh, you can also say that what the pressure here is actually is. So then the pressure would be nkt. We don't have to care about the volume, uh, lowercase n. And if we want to see how this varies, if the pressure varies with the height, well, we can calculate how that varies with the derivative. And that's just deriving p with respect to height. And that's going to correspond to the difference in the number of molecules with respect to height. Both k and t are constants here. On the other hand, you also have the potential energy, which at any given volume is the mass in that volume multiplied by the gravitation constant multiplied by the height we're at. That's true at any particular level. And if you, look at a very, if you look at a very small piece and then you increase the height by delta H, the weight of the gas pressing down in that small area, the small yellow thing I showed in the previous slide. Oops. There. The difference we have there is going to be that potential energy, well, mg delta H, and then the number of molecules in that. And if we have equilibrium here, the potential energy acting down and the pressure acting up, by definition, should be the same. So that I'm using that expression from the last slide, and then I'm just making those two equal. And then I get that equation. And with a tiny amount of exercise, and Maya might actually do this as a screen recording for you to save some time, uh, then we're just simplifying this a bit to making it clear we have a derivative with respect to n there, and then we have n, and then a bunch of constants here. That's a differential equation. And if you remember your math, that actually corresponds to this, the derivative of the logarithm. And if you do a tiny amount of math, you will turn that. And that n is proportional to an exponent raised to minus that constant multiplied by the height. And this really is the Boltzmann distribution if we say that that is mgh is the energy. Now, this was just a special case. But my point is that. If you have a special case, it's not particularly difficult to derive the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, 
What I'm going to do tomorrow is that I'm going to show that this is true for any general system without knowing anything whatsoever about the system, which is slightly more abstract, but I, it is worth having seen that once, but it's a remarkably cool result in physics. What Boltzmann really does, um, Boltzmann is very simple and yet insanely deep. Uh, the Boltzmann distribution tells you at equilibrium, we can calculate the probability of observing two states, state A and state B, just by comparing the energy. And again, for now, energy is potential energy. We don't know anything else. And in particular, that means that we can compare them. So what is the probability of being in state A relative to the probability of being in state B? That really has to do with the quotients of those two Boltzmann factors. And then the constant in front of them disappears. And if you know your exponential laws, uh, that means that if you have a quotient here, you can actually take the difference between the two terms in the exponent, right? So the second, we're talking about relative probabilities between different states. I also end up with the relative difference in energy, which is important. So we no longer have to care about the exact zero level of the energy because we don't know what the zero level of the energy is. What this says that I, you probably already know is that lower energy states will be more populated. And that's going to be the task for your hand in, the first hand in exercise that you should be able to download and uh, work on. I still haven't gotten the submission part working. The Canvas support is working with that. Something went wrong when we copied the course this year. Uh, but the first hand is slightly more complicated. Um, this works beautiful in a simple world when we only have states and you're looking at individual states and comparing their energy. But if you have multiple different vessels here, which one, which shape here would be best energy wise? In a way, this is not a perfect example because they have different volume, but assuming that all these vessels had exactly the same volume, which one would be the best? Where would the atoms have the lowest energy? Mm. Why? You are right, but so this is the one we started from, right? This is complicated, but so here you hardly have any states with low energy, but lots of states with high energy. And instinctively, if the atoms want to be down here, it's good to have a vessel where you have lots of room where they want to be. So already instinctively, we're not just the energy as a function of the height is the same for these two, but somehow it matters how much volume you have or how many states you have accessible, right? So you could argue that in principle, everybody would like to be at the front of the concert, but you probably want 500 people sitting in the first 20 seats because it's going to be a bit crowded. So some people will accept sitting further back, even if the U is not quite as good. And this is the, where things get slightly more complicated in the real world. Uh, let's not assume we know anything, but let's just start working on this. Um, so if you have two states, we can, well, there isn't really anything special here, right? I can count states. It doesn't, that just means that some states will have the same energy. You're going to do that in the lab. So let's say that we have a state A that have a volume B and a state B, sorry, state A that has a volume A. <laughs> Otherwise it would be fun. You can define absolutely anything you want as long as you're fine with the definitions. But state A has a volume A. I think that sounds better. And state B has a volume VB. Rather than volume, you can count it and saying that 50 or 15 or whatever. But so let's just say that the number of state here is somehow proportional to volume. Uh, then the probability of being in A will be proportional to the volume. If all the states of all the, these states and state energy A have the same energy and there are 500 of those, then that means that we're roughly going to increase the likelihood by a factor of 500 compared to only having one if all other things were equal. So if we now take, again, the probability of these two ones, we should somehow weigh that with the number of states in volume A, uh, sorry, the number of volume with the number of states for energy A, and the number of states in this somehow concept B. And this is trivial in a way. We haven't done anything. I've just added a factor in front of each of these. So this sounds Great, but also ugly because I kept introducing constant here. Ah, no, that, that's not going to work fine. Uh, what is VA? We have absolutely no idea what VA is. Uh, let's try a small trick here. Let's say that if I take something, if I have V, and if I first take the logarithm of it and then the exponent, uh, 
V is a volume, so it's positive, so I can always take the logarithm. I, instead of V, I can write the exponential of the logarithm of V. So those Vs that on the previous slides were outside of the exponential, if it's the exponent of the logarithm, well, then I can take that logarithm and move it to the exponent here, right? I haven't done anything. This is just mathematical jujitsu. Uh, I'm just moving things around. And then that KT expression, well, um, let's assume that I want same things on the same fraction. So then I multiply the logarithm by KT and divide it by KT, and then I can write it this way. And that's some way you're going to faint, because this was supposed to be a simplification, and it looks far more horrible than what we started from. Um, so this is where I should give up and take a step back. Because in principle, it doesn't look that bad. There's a ton of constants here, but if forget about the constants for a second. What I was saying that the probability of being in A relative to the probability of being B, but now the entire volumes, that is still a quotient between two exponential numbers, just like the Boltzmann distribution. It walks like a Boltzmann distribution, it quacks like a Boltzmann distribution and everything, but you have something ugly, complicated here that is not just the energy anymore, right? It says E minus T K L N volume instead of E. So let's just define this. We could call them whatever you could call. You could come up with any name you wanted. Um, unfortunately, we have been really stupid because we didn't come up with any other way to call that free energy. There are reasons for calling it the free energy, but this has caused generations of students to torment. Of how do you separate energy from free energy? In hindsight, we should have called it something completely different. But I can't call it something completely different because then you will be completely unable to interact with the rest of the world. So we call this free energy uh, because it will have the units of an energy and everything. But it's not an energy. We should have. We should have called it whatever. I have no idea. Um, the only problem is that this volume gets complicated. It gets really ugly. Uh, so anything we do, we know how to weigh things by a volume. The other problem here is that if I now have two things, I should start multiplying probabilities. And there's turned out to be a very beautiful way. If I take this entire the logarithm of the volume and say the logarithm of the volume is a new constant. I, didn't, I haven't really defined the volume that exactly. So I can certainly take the logarithm of it. We know that it's positive. And to make it even easier, let's build that k, the Boltzmann constant. Let's build that constant into this. Because if you already have something that's a constant, let's throw more constants in it so that we avoid having to see it all the time. This is what we call entropy. Do not for a second try to understand what this means now. This is a definition. It's merely a definition to make the equations on the previous slide simpler to you. Uh, it's a mathematical exercise. If this works out, well, if you do this, you can, instead of having energy, the expression we had on the previous slide, we could call that F, and that's the that E minus temperature multiplied by this new concept we had. And what this will do is that we'll explain the concept if you have different volumes or different amounts of states available. The other really, and that also means that the probability of being in this state A relative to B, this will now be something that looks like a Boltzmann distribution, but instead of the difference in energy, it's the difference in free energy. So the free energy takes into account the multiplicity of states. And I had two students who made a beautiful lab about this a few years ago, and that's your first hand in task. You can do this. You can design this with a very simple Python program. And the second you introduce a degeneracy in the energy level, this logarithm will naturally enter. So it's literally counting states on the microscopic level. It's not the specific volume or anything. This also have a very nice properties. If I have one system here, A1, and another system, A2, you might have heard the things about order and the number of ways of combining them. But probabilities become difficult, because you should take the probability of probability 1 and multiply that with the probability of 2, right, when it has to do with combinations of them. The neat thing with taking logarithms is that if you take the logarithms of those, you can just add the logarithms. Uh, sorry, yes, you add the logarithms. As is the entropy is defined as the logarithm of the number of states, this becomes a property just like energy. The energy in the first state and the energy in the two, to get the total energy, you just add them up. Same thing here, the number of ways you can combine this or the disorder of whatever you might want to think about it, the available volume, 
if we use, because we use the logarithm of this, we end up with a neither nice property that has exactly the same features as energy. You can add it. But this is, there's absolutely nothing wrong. If you like equations along derivations, you're more than welcome to use those expressions. I so would not recommend it. But the point is that this is not a complicated definition we're using. This is something to simplify your lives. Just don't try to think too hard about it and it's not as natural as energy. And it's always gonna turn out to be much more natural. So that's the first thing that I wanna dispel in this course. Many of you probably have a, a hunch that entropy is something really difficult. Entropy is very easy. It's the logarithm of the number of microstates, period. Now it might not be easy with the gut feeling for what that means, uh, but it's not a difficult definition at all. It's completely trivial. So if I show you an example here that this is my desktop. Uh, no, the top left is always not my desktop. Um, how many states does that correspond to? This is the way you place your icons. Well, no, that there are 17 icons, right? But that is one particular placement of the icons. Uh, so if you compare how many states there are in each of the cases, it actually says that is just one state. There's one particular way of organizing them. So how many states does that correspond to? One. Yes, and that's the first one. There is a, if you're looking at a snapshot, static snapshot, it's only one specific state. And these two are exactly equivalent, which does not correspond to your gut feeling about it, right? This is somehow more ordered and that's more. And the reason for that is that how, if you think about how many similar states are there. There are very few states that are similar to that one, but there are very many states that are similar to that one. So where, where our minds go wrong here is that you really have two ways of defining states. One way of defining state is what is the exact X and Y coordinate of every single icon? But that is not how you think about the state. You think about the states, you've taken the 10,000 foot view of this, right? roughly how ordered are they and roughly what is the organization. And we should probably separate these definitions so that you could call it a microscopic state or a microstates. That's the X and Y coordinates. But we prefer to say, well, if all the icons are neatly lined up, that's one or a few states. But if all the icons are in a horrible mesh, there are, there are lots of states similar to that. So if you just randomly throw them out, it's much more likely to end up in one of those states. And that's why, that's why you can occasionally interpret entropy in terms of disorder. The disorder corresponds to more volumes available and everything. But that is just the interpretation of en entropy. And I think that's where lots of us go wrong when we somehow try to define entropy as disorder. Entropy is strictly just the logarithm of the states. Then it's our minds that tend to associate that with order. This can actually explain a lot of things. Um, for instance, why oil forms droplets in water. Because it turns out that there's going to be more ways that the waters, waters in particular, can orient favorably if you put all the oil in one place rather than disperse the oil throughout the water. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a second. And that's why the reason why we're now going to move over a lot to free energy is that free energy will be able to tell us what things happen. When do phases separate? When do we have phase transitions? When will a hydrogen bond form? Not just that it can form in theory. So free energy is much cooler than energy because free energy starts to interface with chemistry and the real world in a way that energy never does. So in particular, free energy will tell us that this virtually, this will never happen. I'm still waiting for this to happen on my desktop, but, um, and if you look at the laws of thermodynamics, this really corresponds to the second law here that the entropy of an isolated system not in equilibrium will keep increasing over time and approach a maximum when it reaches equilibrium. So you want to, well, you want to spread, remember those tests, those tubes, the vessels where you had the gas, right? That gas wants to spread out over all states. And if you're spreading things out over all states, the available volume is larger until you've spread it out over all states and that's when you have the max in entropy. So that the mere fact that things want to spread out, that's what's gonna give you the property that the entropy strives to increase. If this was not complicated enough, um, physicists and chemists can't ever agree on anything. Sorry. Uh, so if you're a physicist, life is simple. You 
have a well-defined unique system and you only have these interactions I spoke about roughly. And yet this system, if you're a physicist, you always want to isolate the system from the world. You might say that you can exchange heat with the rest of the world, as we do on the left here. And that's what the physicist would call Helmholtz free energy. It's plain, it's simple, you only focus on the essentials. The only problem is that it doesn't correspond to reality. Because in chemistry, this is super difficult to achieve in a lab. You would need a very special container. And what you'd rather have in chemistry, you have open test tubes, right? But if you, have a, if you take one liter of water and mix that with one liter of ethanol, the new volume is not two liters, but roughly 1.8 liters. So that you're also gonna have effects of the pressure and the interaction with the surroundings. So in chemistry, to be strict, you also have to care with the fact that the size of the system can expand or contract. And then you need to include this P multiplied by V term, the work you're doing on the environment. And now I'm gonna do something that makes you happy. I'm gonna happily ignore that for the rest of this course. And the reason, that this is super, and super important difference if you're designing, if you're working with gases, uh, air, air flow or anything, because then the, the pressure effect can by far be the largest contribution. But for proteins and life sciences, we typically work with concentrations that in the millimolar or nanomolar, right? So we have, so the concentration of samples we have is so insanely small that this P by V term is gonna be a millionth of all the other terms. So we will happily ignore it. So if you're a chemist, we should always work with Gibbs free energy. We typically call it delta G, but there are so many cases you will just see me saying, well, we talk about G, but then I say E minus TS. So the whole different difference here, the physicists would use E. Strictly, if I should be proper, I should use H all the time, but we are sloppy. Everyone is sloppy. Just as we're sloppy when it comes to the difference between energy and free energy, people are sloppy between the difference between F and G because chemists don't care about Helmholtz. Hel chemists will happily use F when they mean Gibbs free energy. The only solution is you have to be careful about your definitions. By all means, you can use Z for this if you want to, if you properly define that that's what you mean by your free energy. Um, in an ideal world, we would be super careful, but nobody is. And even I'm sure that I will screw up in this class too. So if it was not enough to confuse, uh, well, if you think that things were easy now, I'm gonna make it a bit more difficult. This morning you probably thought that entropy was easy but temperature, sorry, entropy was difficult but temperature was easy. I'm gonna argue exactly the opposite way around. Entropy is a super simple definition that any, anybody who knows a logarithm can understand entropy. It's just a plain definition. Temperature on the other hand, that is really, really difficult. Uh, so in all those equations, I just introduced the T and there was not a single one of you who asked me about what the T is. Why didn't you ask me about that? Because it's something you've seen in equations for 25, well, 30 years and you just assumed that it was temperature, right? There was nothing in those equations that has said that it was temperature. Uh, and in principle, this is just a constant in these equations, a constant that depends on the conditions where you're performing the experiment. And if you just start from this definition, we had F equals E minus TS. Oh my God, it's fun. Uh, so I just, yeah, it was 30 seconds ago. The first thing I do is that I dropped, I just dropped the PV, but I called it F anyway. Um, it was not intentional. If you look at the very small difference here, just an infinitesimally small change, DF or delta F, you can actually use this to extract, take the temperature and extract this. Uh, at equilibrium, if we have an equilibrium and we argue that this is a property of this environment, at equilibrium this should be constant. And we also, as I hinted before, that we believe that the free energy has a local minimum at this equilibrium. I haven't proven that. Uh, then a bunch of these terms will disappear because E minus TS should be zero. And if you then use that and just solve for the temperature, it turns out that the, this T constant is really the derivative of the energy with respect to entropy. And that is completely obvious to you, right? It's not to me. I have absolutely no idea what that means. I have zero gut feeling for that. Actually, that, that is an equation I do know, but no matter how much I look at that equation, it doesn't make sense to me. It does not correspond to anything natural. It's kind of a slope of, as we are increasing the volume, how 
how sensitive is the increase in energy relative to the amount of local volume that's available? It's completely non-natural. But the really cool thing is that this is a property that we're not defining. It's not something that you measure on a thermometer. This is a fundamental property we get from statistical mechanics. And the, the absurd thing is that entropy that any teenager thinks that entropy is really difficult. Entropy is plain simple. Temperature is one of the most complicated phenomena in modern physics. Uh, so it's exactly the opposite of what you're used to. Having said that, you can just, this is the thermodynamic definition of temperature. Uh, it's exact. And normally today in the SI, this is how we define temperature. It has nothing to do with the heat and the surrounding. That is just how we, on a day-to-day -day basis, are used to interpret temperature. And armed with this, it turns out that we can actually describe a, quite a few things very well. Um, phase transitions, we spoke this morning about when things are solid versus when they are liquid. Why do things convert between solid and liquid? Well, that will have to correspond to these differences in free energy. So at very, very low temperature, which is this thing we defined on the last slide, at special environment conditions, you have a very well-ordered system. So that's going to give you very low energy, low energy or potential energy, that's good. On the other hand, it's also a very well-ordered system, and a very well-ordered system corresponds to very low volume, right? And that means that the entropy is low. So both that term is low, and that term is also low. On the other end, if you have a completely disordered system here, the energy is not going to be as good because the interaction is not ideal. But on the other hand, there are also a much, more, much larger diversity of states. So there are more microscopic states that the system might occur in. Compare that to all the icons on my desktop, right? So that the entropy is also going to be larger because the available volume, all the different ways we can put these atoms, it's much larger. So that means either they are low, low, or they are high, high. So I can't instantly say which one of this is better. Which one is better? Actually, I can, because the balance here will depend on the constant t here, right? If t is zero, the influence of this S entropy term disappears, then it's only a matter of the energy. So at a temperature that's sufficiently low, you want to be in a well-ordered state. And that's eventually why anything will be a solid. But as the temperature here increases, this term will start to gain in importance. And eventually, it's more important for the system to have a good low, sorry, good high entropy rather than having the lowest possible energy. And that's why eventually the molecules at higher temperature, it will be more important to have this freedom, even if that means paying a bit in terms of having not quite as good energy. And armed with that, you can start to solve some. Yes? So you said about solid, you have low energy, low entropy, hmm? and the molecule, the high entropy, high entropy. But the phase transition itself, why not the function? We will come back to what the phase transition is. Uh, for now, I'd say super good questions, but that we'll have to wait until tomorrow. Uh, that's going to be the next step. What actually happens at a phase transition? But armed with this, you can already now start to debunking some of the greatest myths in science. You are probably too old for, or too young for this. Uh, in 1962, there was an amazing result uh, from the uh, Soviet Union where Fedyakin and Deryagin published a result where they have claimed that they had discovered polywater. So under very special conditions, and if you push water through very narrow capillaries, they argued that they had found a new state of water where water spontaneously started to polymerize. So a completely different phase of water. It's a liquid phase, but that would be more polymer-like with a much higher viscosity and everything. And this was brand new physics. Uh, this started to make the uh, reputations at different conferences and everything. And the US were terrified that Russia would, uh, the Soviet Union would develop a poly water gap. Um, and people even argued that there was some sort of strange hydrogen bond formation pattern between waters that would create some sort of super molecules here. They would also argue that the freezing, this was very different from molten water. You would have a freezing point that was just 240 Kelvin and a boiling point that was much higher here. This is, of course, completely bollocks. And based on what you know now, you should be able to debunk this. 
I'm well aware that this is not trivial. Um, in the interest of time, I might not give you five minutes to talk through this. Um, but, and this is not mentioned in the book, but there is a small paper about poly water. If you just draw these three phases, li solid, liquid, and gas as a function of temperature for any, any normal molecule like water, at the very lowest temperature, we know that the solid should be the best one, right? The lowest one. And similarly, at very high temperatures, we know that the gas phase should be the best one and that there is some sort of intermediate range where the liquid is best. But based just on those two numbers, if you have a freezing point of poly water that is down there, and then a boiling point that is up here, there should be a, some sort of pink curve here that is constantly below the green curve, right? So what would happen to all the water in the world? If this was true, all the water would prefer to be polywater. And I'm not sure about you, but I haven't seen a whole lot of polywater around. So it was completely uh, false. Actually, it was an incorrect result, and it was actually due to when you push it through these capillaries, you actually get parts of the glass walls and everything to eventually leave this. So you would have silicone uh, dioxide and everything ending up in the water. Uh, but this was a very, it was took about a year and there was gigantic conferences about this and the US were worried that the Russians had discovered something about fundamental physics they didn't understand. There is quite a fun novel about this that Kurt Vonnegut wrote uh, called Cat's Cradle, uh, where, uh, well, it's not a particularly good novel, I guess, but part of the picture is that there is a new form of ice called Ice-9. Uh, and the idea with ice nine is that any, if ice nine ever comes in touch, uh, any water that comes in touch with ice nine will eventually form this new face and then this leads to some complicated things. Uh, and there, there are a ton of different forms of ice. Uh, lots of different crystal forms at different pressures and temperatures and everything. We're not gonna go through that in details, but then again, that has to do with these complications, right? Uh, but the important thing is just armed with this F equals E minus TS. It's a, at first sight, it's a remarkably simple equation. It's an exceptionally deep equation that can explain 90% of everything you see around it. It's a, you could even organize, it's a bit embarrassing that uh, Vyakin and Deryagin didn't really sit down five minutes and think about this. So I will come back to this several times in this class. If there is, this is also an equation you need to know if I wake you at 2 a.m. in the morning. Look at F equals E minus TS, and not just, you already know it by heart, right? But there's a fundamental difference between knowing this equation by heart and understanding what it means and learning to work with it. And that's increasingly what I'm gonna force you to do, learn to work with this and think about what it actually means. And as a small exercise, we can look at hydrogen bond formation. Uh, if you have two waters in vacuum, two water molecules, uh, we might want to investigate what happens when you form a hydrogen bond. Why will a hydrogen bond form? Well, we know what happens is that there is a change. When we, when we gain a hydrogen bond here, there is some sort of change in energy, and it's no big surprise that that's going to be, if the, en the energy of something that does interact is smaller than zero, um, it's, a, um, it's advantage to have it. You will also lose some mobility here uh, because there are more ways to orient those molecules, but if we now tie these molecules together, we're gonna lose a bit of freedom here. The exact amount degree of freedom we lose, we can calculate. Each water molecule participates in four hydrogen bonds. There, 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 there. So that means two hydrogen bonds per molecule on average, right? Because there's a donor and acceptor for each of them. And if we assume that if you form both, we're in ice, we're completely rigid. So we have lost half of that, so 0 0.5 by two. So we've lost entropy corresponding to one freely rotating water. And it's less advantageous here. So already we can say that the delta S here is smaller than zero. And now you should be able to answer here, what is true for H bond formation? Is delta E smaller than T delta S or T delta S smaller than delta E? Why? So to how many of this, 
So first, do we have any other suggestions? <laughs> That's certainly true. Uh, how, were, how did you try to think about this? You have memory like a goldfish. What did I tell you 20 seconds ago? There is a very simple equation. <laughs> Use, not the force, but the equation. Um, actually, I deliberately cheat a little bit. First, F equals E minus TS is a bit oversimplified. The first thing you need to care about, anytime there is a process happening, there is a before and after, right? So start by writing down what is the before and what is the after. And if it's before and after, it's a change. Then we should think about it's not just F, but it's delta F. So what is the change in free energy? And that corresponds to a change in energy and a change in entropy. And you had exactly the right, the trigger. We know that if the hydrogen bond forms, if there is a hydrogen bond formation, for that to happen, what, has, what does the sign of delta F have to be? Negative. Negative. Otherwise, it would not happen spontaneously. The second you've done that, it's just you have zero equals delta E minus T delta S, and then you just solve for it. So don't, the point is equations, they're a help. They help you. I, so to tell the truth, if somebody woke me up in the middle of the night and said delta E minus T delta S, I could not say which one is smaller, but I could write down this equation. And two minutes later, I would tell you which one is smaller because I looked at the equation. So don't try to hand wave this and juggle and guess what do we. Always go back to E minus T delta S and think about it. The cool thing is that we're not going to have particularly complicated equations, but this particular equation we need to know. Uh, so as I expected, I didn't quite have time to finish all the slides today either. That's fine. Um, but. Uh, what I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to start going through a little bit more in detail what this means for things like formation, both in proteins and, for instance, the hydrophobic effect when we put oil in water. And then I'm going to come back, once we've done this hand-waving ways of treating free energies, then I'm going to come back a little bit and do a slightly more proper physical derivation of the Boltzmann distribution. And the reason for that, it's not something I expect you to know by heart, but it's worth have seen it once because it's universal. It's true for every single system. You don't have to assume anything about the system, and that's what makes it so amazingly powerful. Because we haven't assumed anything, we know that it's going to remain true forever, no matter what other discoveries are made in physics. And then armed with that, we can take an even deeper tour into more complicated biochemical systems and start looking at what this implies for proteins. And then on Friday, that's going to turn this into protein structure. Um, but if there's one thing you should do, you should go home and look at this equation and think about what it means for different phases and everything. And then we'll talk about phase transitions more.